All right, it's 6 p.m. I think we can start now. <laughs> I would like to welcome everyone to this webinar with Pierrette on the new Sotelo, uh, Sharing Ground, Carving Space, Masculinities, Migration and Raci Racial sanctuary Sanctuaries in the City. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay, I'm here back. Sorry, uh, I've had YouTube on at the same time. That's why you could hear me twice. Um, uh, and uh, this uh, webinar is part of a series of migration seminars, new approaches to migration theory and research, organized by the Center of Migration Research at the University of Warsaw. And before I introduce our guest speaker, just a few technicalities. The webinar will last up to one and a half hours. And the presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. So during the presentation, you can write down your questions or comments in the chat. And after the presentation, we'll read them out loud together with my colleague from CMR, Camila Fiokoska. Now, uh, Pierrette Ondanyu Sotelo is professor of sociology at the University of Southern California. Her research interests include migration, gender, religion, and in particular, she writes on as she writes on her webpage. With her research, she wants to lift up the voices and contributions of disenfranchised and often underappreciated Latina immigrants. She wants to understand as well the social processes of migrants' daily lives, and recently, she analyzes how place situates the way we live. She's extremely well published. Her single author books include God's Heart has no borders, uh, Domestica and Paradise Transplanted. And she is also the co-author of a forthcoming book, South Central Dreams, Finding Home and Building Community in South Los Angeles. We are delighted that you have accepted our invitation and I'm looking very much forward to hear your presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Martha for inviting me. Thanks for everybody who's tuning in. Um, I, um, I'm going to apologize first off because I think I put too many slides in this presentation. What I'm going to try to do in this short period of time is do an overview of this book that she's just mentioned, South Central Dreams. And then I do want to talk specifically about one chapter that focuses on African American and Latino immigrant men in public green spaces, in parks, in community gardens. So um, basically, as you will hear, I'm very committed to bringing place back in uh, or, or into the study, uh, the sociological study of immigration, which I think has been, I think I've, we've been a very placeless kind of, um, uh, we've had very placeless kind of approach and I'm also paying, trying to pay attention to nature and most importantly, this idea of home. So I am now going to begin sharing my PowerPoint. Okay, you can all see that, yes? Yeah, so that's my title yes. page. Um, Uh-oh. Okay, so um, this is a hashtag that started, as you know, we live in highly xenophobic times around the world. The United States is certainly no exception, but a hashtag that began appearing a few years ago was, I'm already home. And it's very similar, I think, to other claims that have made, been made by immigrants around the world. Oh my gosh. I'm having, tr I'm so sorry. Let me try this. There we go. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about a place called South LA, a uh, little bumper sticker, I love South LA. So getting at um, the affect that migrants may develop for particular places. So much of the literature, you know, focuses on my uh, immigrant melancholy, nostalgia for the homeland, but I'm suggesting something else is happening. We all know, I think everybody who's in this webinar knows we live in this age of migration, which is not just going from south to north, but in many different directions from south-south as well. And 
um, those of us who have been studying immigration uh, will recognize these familiar paradigms that have become our tradition, assimilation now over a hundred years old, still running strong in the United States, at least transnationalism, um, probably um, more current. And I think um, another paradigm that has emerged in recent years, it's very important, focuses on these me mechanisms of exclusion, uh, immigration coming out of law, racialization exclusions um, as well. Um, so the research questions that we ask, and I'll, I will describe my study, my co-authored study here in a moment, are basically how Latino immigrants have made themselves at home um, not just in the United States, but in specific places, in specific non-white places, historically African-American neighborhoods. We're interested in both how first generation and their second generation children, now adults, narrate their experiences, their identities, their relationships with African-Americans. And then, as I said, I'm going to squeeze in to this presentation a specific kind of a side study I did on men in parks and urban community gardens, really looking at what I see as two groups of men who, yes, have masculine privilege, but are also marginalized by race, immigration status, poverty, uh, working class status, and how they kind of find a public home in these green spaces. Here's our book cover, which I think is quite beautiful. Um, I co-authored this with Manuel Pastord. It'll be coming out in, um, I, th I think, the end of spring 2021. And there's only two author names on the cover, but we have brought in our many research assistants as co-authors on the different chapters. It was the first time I've been involved in um, multi-year mixed methods study. It was quite a journey. Um, some of it very enjoyable, some of it a little frustrating, but I'm happy the book is coming out. So how do we do the research? Well, in um, the left-hand column here, I'm putting the majority, really the base of the qualitative um, component that I oversaw included 100 interviews with first and second generation um, Latino immigrants who've come to this area called South LA. I'll show you some maps of it. Um, these were semi-structured interviews, one-time interviews, um, and they were conducted by myself and um, a research team. And then Manuel, who's trained as an economist, um, did census analysis and mapping. I'm gonna share some of these cool slides with you, focusing on demographic change. In addition, we all interviewed some civic leaders. There was a small study of um, interviews with African-Americans. And then I spent um, some time doing some ethnographic research at these parks and gardens, did about 45 interviews with both African-American men and Latino immigrant men. I'll tell you these parks and gardens I discovered are not places, we can go into this later, that women come to freely. We still have this very, you know, these divisions of public private space and perceptions of public spaces not being welcoming or safe or um, allowing for, for leisure for women. So, um, what I'm interested in is building a parad a new way of understanding immigration that gets us away from assimilation, transnationalism, and these mechanisms of exclusion, which I think are important, but um, didn't really provide the kind of frameworks that made sense for our project. So a lot of the older literature has been focused on spatial assimilation. For example, in the United States, there's the notion that immigrants will first come to a very poor urban neighborhood. And as they do better, as they become more acculturated and socially mobile, they will move out to suburbs or white suburbs. And instead, we're really focused on looking at spatial transformation, like how does one particular neighborhood become transformed materially, socially, through the way people enact daily um, uh, interactions and behavior. Um, another old Chicago school 
um, notion is one of ethnic secession, right? One uh, group comes to the neighbor neighborhood and then uh, perhaps moves out, somebody else comes in, right? And instead we have been, um, here I'm inspired by the geographer Wendy Cheng and this kind of geologic metaphor of sediments. So um, in South LA, as you will see, there are still African-American people, uh, although their numbers have diminished, but African-American culture, traditions, legacies, mentors are still very strong. And we see um, a lot of second generation Latinos really um, uh, grabbing on and finding a lot of resonance with that. So that's why racial ethnic sedimentation is a concept. And rather, then thinking of these monolithic racial identities, African-Americans or Latinos, we have found this very strong place-based identity, like that little sticker I showed, I love South LA, this kind of love and pride for particular neighborhoods like Watts, which is one of our study neighborhoods. Um, so we're interested in how uh, in place-based identity and the way that can be racialized. And then fundamentally homemaking, um, which I see as sort of um, a, a, a uniquely subject-centered um, perspective um, on uh, immigration. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, assimilation, I don't think I need to go through all those slides, but you get it. This is a hundred year old perspective. And there's still some really interesting younger scholars um, like Jody Agius Vallejo and um, Tomas Jimenez who are working uh, in this paradigm. Transnationalism um, has grown. So as I'm sure everybody in this uh, webinar knows has grown in so many rich directions. But I think it's important as a sociologist for me to remember that it really begins with the work of people in anthropology like Roger Rouse and Nina Glick Schiller and colleagues and has expanded outward. And today there's so much exciting work, I think, around illegalities and these different mechanisms of exclusion coming from history, anthropology, sociology, um, a lot of really exciting work um, as you know, on our uh, deportation and, and detention regimes in, in the United States, for example. So how does an immigrant homemaking perspective differ? I'm, built, I'm you know, uh, taking on some building blocks um, uh, from elsewhere, including uh, Canadian scholars, um, Louster and um, Zhao, who uh, have a study about Chinese immigrants um, or middle-class immigrants in uh, Vancouver, and they really draw attention to the work, the labor that is involved in making new homes, both materially and emotionally. And I love this kind of notion they have of settling for, right? You know, a home sweet home is not always the idea, the ideal people had once imagined. So there's kind of an emotional um, come, a reckoning there also. Uh, another book I like very much is by this group of Mexican sociologists who are located at COLEF, that's the Colegio de la Frontera Norte. Um, I think Mexico's leading, it is Mexico's leading immigration center and the book was translated into English. It's a study of Mexican immigrants in Los Angeles and really um, you know, prompting us to see integration as a process, diverse modalities, and for me, one very important little uh, factoid of their uh, study uh, is or finding is that only seven of the 90 Mexican immigrants that they interviewed from, there were these different waves, they chose um, uh, three different locales, but um, a, a very small minority, seven out of 90 um, said that, um, their stay in the US was going to just be temporary before returning to Mexico. So that's kind of a big sea change from what we saw say 20 years ago with uh, Mexican immigrants. And then um, one of the major theorists, I think the major theorists of homemaking perspective is Italian sociologist Paolo uh, Boccani who has um, this 
um, uh, kind of a theoretical treatise on migration and homemaking. And as you may know, he's uh, um, overseeing a very large multi-sided, multi-year study uh, with many uh, researchers throughout Europe looking at what he calls the homing process, right? Again, drawing attention to sort of the emotional aspect, but also the material aspect. Um, and he gives us this um, framework of um, homemaking involving uh, the search for security, familiarity, control, which I think is very uh, important. And I've added uh, future making um, to that list as well. And then another uh, Italian scholar, Adriano Cancellieri, has um, a study I really like um, about one huge condo, condominium building. And he offers us this notion of re-territorialization, re drawing our attention to the way migrants um, transform the spaces they live, give the places meaning, right? Um, that are very uh, particular, right? Again, attention to material life. Um, and then an article I wrote a few years ago from another study in a different part of South uh, of Los Angeles, more from the Westlake Pico Union neighborhood, more of a Central American neighborhood where I spent time in, in gardens. Although this photo I will tell you is from Watts, California. And here I draw attention to the way uh, migrant life in these urban gardens is recreation. It's a form of leisure for people who are working and have very hard lives to restore themselves, but it's also a way of recreating the homeland um, through nature, right? Transforming exactly what is on the ground. So in this photo, you will see pictures of nopales. These are uh, cacti. This cactus is a delicacy for Mexicans. Um, and um, quite, uh, it, when, once you're gonna harvest this, it's very labor intensive to take the spines away. Um, I, uh, in the book, I refer to some of the transformations that are happening in South LA as the rancho uh, fication, right? Making urban neighborhoods in LA look like ranchos. And during my uh, time in uh, urban, this very urban, area, I saw three ponies, three horses in neighborhoods where you don't normally see horses. And of course, cultivation of um, vegetables and um, homeland fruits. So um, I, in this other article, I refer to these as sort of palliative sanctuaries in the city. Okay, so here's a map of South LA. Um, uh, I don't have a pointer, but up at the top, if you've ever been to Los Angeles, you'll see that freeway. We refer to everything with numbers. That is the 10. If you were to go to Santa Monica, you would continue west to the ocean. To the right of the 10 is um, the glamorous high rise uh, part of um, Los Angeles. Uh, business, entertainment centers, kind of a, uh, a luxury global uh, site. And then, this area in yellow um, is um, South LA. And we've used these census tracts um, to chart the change here. So my quantitative colleagues show in this very nice graph here how uh, the population has changed. And you will see uh, very easily that the Latino population has grown. That's shown in blue. The African-American population is diminished. But what I really want to call your attention to, because we might think of LA as a very, people say it's such a diverse multicultural city. Well, it's also a very segregated city. So you will see very, very few white and Asian Americans um, in these neighborhoods. These are really black and uh, Latino and primarily Latino immigrant neighborhoods. So some of the history of uh, very quickly of late 20th century in South LA uh, begin with the 1965 Watts riots also referred to as the Watts rebellions, the same issue that we saw with George Floyd this summer and so many others is what sparked 
um, the Watts rebellions, like black men getting pulled over by the police in a police car. And after decades of white flight and divestment, um, right, Watts burned for days. Um, and in part, this is a response to decline of manufacturing, deindustrialization in the 1980s, um, uh, crack cocaine crisis, a lot of gang violence, a lot of this glamorized in uh, hip hop music and movies of the era, and um, culminating um, with the uh, the Rodney King Rebellion in 1992, very similar story there. Um, so today, African-American population in South LA has diminished. This is not the major focus of our study, but to explain why, well, mass incarceration. I think everybody knows the United States is the world leader in incarceration disproportionately with African-Americans and especially African-American men. In the context of the violence and the deindustrialization that I um, described in the 1980s and 1990s, many black working class and middle class families fled these areas, right? They didn't want their children and themselves exposed to these dangers. Many of them went to uh, what they perceived to be a safer middle class exurbs. So San Bernardino County, which is just directly east of Los Angeles, the black population doubled uh, over a span of 20 years. The Antelope Valley is um, north, that uh, black population tripled. And then also throughout the United States in recent years, we've been seeing a black migration. You know, the great migration took African-Americans fleeing racial violence in the South to Chicago, New York, San Francisco, Oakland. And we're starting, to, we have been seeing a return migration back to the South, especially to Atlanta, Charleston, Houston, also Nevada, which is not in uh, the South. Um, so kind of a reversal of the great migration. In LA, we've also seen among better off or more middle-class African-Americans, a westward migration to Lemert Park, which I think is kind of the new homeland of African-American, it's a sort of a cultural renaissance happening right there. Other communities are Baldwin Hills, Ladera Heights. And as I said, this is happening from East Palo Alto, from Oakland, Chicago, Detroit. This is not my study, but it's um, an, the, the important backdrop of our study. And at a um, event I attended a few years ago um, in South Central, LA, um, there were many elder African-American civil rights leaders, journalists, activists who returned. And um, at the bottom, I've placed the quote of Larry Aubrey, longtime uh, activist, civil rights activist and journalist. And he expressed, I thought in a very pithy way, the sense, a kind of a, of mourning, of loss, of black loss. We got what we wanted but we lost what we had. In other words, the end of redlining, the opening of African-Americans being able to move to other neighborhoods led to a loss of community institutions um, that you know, were protective. What's the story of Mexican immigration in uh, LA? Very quickly, uh, early 20th century Los Angeles brought, attracted Mexican immigrants to work in these kind of primary sectors, right? And the outskirts and agriculture, uh, incipient uh, factories and the railroads, but in very segregated ways. So the East side, East LA became the homeland for Mexicans. Uh, there were colonias, these agricultural areas, out, uh, especially with oranges, the orange was um, the, kind of a, the key cash crop here. And then beginning really with World War I, we see this pattern of the United States, just like the guest worker programs in, in Europe, inviting Mexicans in to do labor and uh, excluding um, in times when they're not needed, such as uh, the Great Depression, um, when we had a full-blown uh, repatriation or massive deportation uh, movement. Uh, World War II brought uh, nearly the issuance of nearly 5 million temporary labor contracts 
to Mexican man who worked as uh, braceros. Um, but all of those who, stu us who study immigration, we know, we know there's no such thing as a temporary uh, migration. And this came really to be the foundation for the um, substantial Mexican uh, uh, Mexican immigrant, Mexican-American community in the United States. In 1965, we get the liberalization of immigration law, family reunification, the end of the racial exclusions that had kept Asians out. And after World War II, you know, this post-war growth, a lot of employment diversification and need, demand for Mexican immigrant labor in cities and suburbs, not just in the fields. And we see a lot of age and gender uh, diversification and the um, uh, emergence of permanent family settlement, which is the topic of my first book, uh, uh, Gender Transitions. Here, I wanna go return back uh, to South LA, this area we studied. It's, I'm sorry, I'm very bad with my metric conversions to kilometers, but this is about a 50 uh, square mile area. The population, it's like a city within a city. These are mega neighborhoods. There's uh, about 800,000, over 800,000 people who live in this area we call South LA. The dark green uh, areas that you see here show greater than 65% African-American population in 1980. By 1990, it looks like that. And by uh, 2000, it looks like this. Uh, 2010, it looks like that. Um, and now I'm gonna show you um, the growth of Latino population who are uh, um, shown through dark brown here. So darker brown shows greater than 80%. Um, very, at the very, so you see uh, two basic neighborhoods. Oops. Yeah. And uh, by 1990, here's what it looks like by 2000, by 2010. Um, so this is a very big neighborhood, mega neighborhood to focus on. We chose to focus on these particular census tracts. Um, the one in the far right corner is called a historic South Central. I would say this was really the um, central site of African-American culture in the early 20th century. Um, the famous uh, there was a, a famous, the Dunbar Jazz Hotel was located there. So if Count Basie or uh, W.E.B. Du Bois came to town, they stayed there, they performed there. Um, famous churches, long civil rights activism. Down at the bottom, further south is Watts, which you, you may have heard of. It was then called Mudtown, a much more rural kind of space. And um, and then in the middle, we have uh, Vermont Square and Vermont Slauson, uh, less uh, name recognition. But we chose those three neighborhoods for different reasons. They seem to be in different, they, they each have their own particularities. Um, here is a home in Watts. So, you know, um, uh, these are very poor neighborhoods uh, with a lot of problems. But there is beautiful, as you will see, beautiful housing stock with well-tended gardens. Notice the bars and uh, on the windows, uh, barred around um, the, uh, the porches there. Um, but these Italian cypress trees, fruit trees galore, roses. Um, so uh, around the block is a very you know, dangerous kind of neighborhood, but this is really to kind of emphasize this sort of homemaking, this kind of pride, the way um, people um, have found um, uh, kind of pleasurable, secure places to live. Okay, I'm going to go now, um, I'm not going to read all of these quotes, but these are, you know, taken from these uh, interviews we did. So. The story uh, of first generation Latinos who are Central Americans and Mexicans who come to these historically black neighborhoods in the 1980s. Well, it is one of a lot of fear and anxiety about violence and a lot of fear and anxiety about black people. So Latino immigrants coming from Central America 
and Mexico often had very little experience, direct experience with African Americans. And um, I think as various researchers have shown, um, learning racial hierarchies is one of the first things uh, immigrants can learn. And also, as I described earlier, they were arriving in neighborhoods beset with a lot of problems, this crack cocaine um, crisis that makes people crazy, um, a lot of gang violence, uh, over-policing and under-policing as well. Um, and um, a lot of prejudices, um, but also a lot of firsthand experiences with violence at the hands of African-Americans, mostly African-American street youth, right? People selling drugs uh, or in gangs. So I did hear, hear in these interviews sort of horrific um, stories of being um, attacked at a bus stop with um, knives, having, you know, little Latina ladies who wear the gold crosses, having their gold chains ripped off um, their necks. Um, and, um, and then, you know, guns, as you know, guns are very um, popular in the United States. So many experiences with household burglaries, um, um, et cetera. And so what is the response for Latino immigrants making home in these conditions is really, as one of them told us, a shutty, about shutting in and shutting out. So this thing, as I showed you in that, um, the photo of the house, putting up lots of fences, gates, multiple locks. As I went into these homes, sometimes there were these elaborate porch cages around the front porches or many different double bolts. Um, parents would tell their children these elaborate spatial mobility strategies for how to get to school. Don't walk through that park parks were definitely seen as uh, dangerous. Don't, you know, go to that bus stop. Um, and um, a fair amount of social distance from African American neighbors with some important exceptions. But at the same time, um, they, our respondents express this sense of freedom, pleasure, what, what you can do in the boundaries of your home, especially if they had a single detached home, which as you know, is such an American ideal that kind of resonates with people from rural backgrounds, a rancho, right? So you could play your music really loud, have parties, um, a lot of uh, informal sector work located in the home, whether it's being a mechanic out on the driveway, um, this thing about, you know, nature, the, the mini rancho. Uh, a lot of women have sold, um, will set up like informal um, swap meet or selling um, used clothing uh, from the sidewalks, prepared foods. Um, but there's a lot of varied reactions as well. So in the first quote, you see a civic leader a Latino civic leader sort of recalling the racism of um, his parents. Um, um, but then we also hear in the second quote from a woman who said, yeah, well, we would hear people would tell us, be, be careful, you know, African-Americans are, are going to attack you. But she says, well, we saw none of that, right? You know, and so we heard a lot of narratives of um, neighborliness and kind of, um, especially from families and older African-Americans, a kind of uh, mentorship, especially when it came uh, to parenting. And uh, in the third quote, um, another gentleman is telling us like, well, yes, we heard all these scary stories, but you know, that's not what we heard. And actually one interviewee I uh, you know, uh, interviewed reminded me that some of LA's most gruesome uh, murders did not happen in South LA, but have happened uh, in Beverly Hills and other uh, upscale communities. Um, a strong, um, uh, a, a strong second generation uh, respondents um, in a very strong voice criticized their parents' anti-Black racism, this kind of reverse uh, socialization. Um, um, I like the second quote, you know, this guy says, everybody's grandma's a racist, right? Every, the whole older generation 
um, uh, newer immigrants, uh, older people, second generation are sort of disassociating themselves from that. At the same time, they also, mm, they weren't apologizing, but they were also explaining, you know, our parents are monolingual. Our parents are at work at one or two or three jobs. They're raising their families. They don't have time to learn English. They don't have time to go to the PTA or the community uh, meetings. So, you know, as the, the second respondent says here, they're staying in their own little um, comfort zone. They're not interested in learning about the community because they have these other urgencies of trying to survive, which namely means working at these hard jobs for very low wages, supporting their family, and generally sending uh, money to family um, in their uh, countries of origin. Um, second generation experiences with African Americans in South LA are different. Um, Yes, a lot of violence in the schools early on, especially in the middle schools and high schools, a lot of bullying. Um, but at the same time, uh, a lot of Latino second generation, again, I'm not going to read these quotes, you can read them uh, yourselves, but a lot of uh, second generation Latinos saying, you know, they were, these were my friends that I played sports with, my first girlfriend, um, um, my next door neighbor. Um, we're going through the same struggles, right? You know, um, so this kind of understanding of similarity and we're in this uh, boat together. So um, I mentioned this, um, this, this kind of framework for understanding homemaking, which I use with the first generation, but also very apt for the second generation. So um, for the second generation, security is not so much about the home, but about their own physical safety out in public, uh, negotiating safety with both other gangs, and I think for boys especially difficult, and with police uh, violence. Um, familiarity, we heard a lot of second generation youth um, uh, express gratitude to African-American teachers, elders, mentors who would help them, right? As tutors, as, you know, just friendly, protective people in the community. Um, and um, uh, another experience that I discuss in the second generation chapter is that many of, um, for various reasons, a lot of uh, Latino youth bust out to other school districts, right, that were seen as safer, better schools. And when they did, uh, they realized how the rest of the world saw South LA. South Central LA is a stigmatized place, right, da seen as dangerous, dirty, uh, inferior. And that really prompted them um, to turn around and see this as their own, to really take stock of their home and to be proud of South LA. And particularly, it, I think it really pushed them further to embrace Black culture and influence and everything it's given them. So this kind of future making I talk about is um, quite astonishing. A lot of the second generation people we interviewed and you know our sample was non, it's not a random sample. Um, and for various reasons, I think we got an overeducated second generation group, which means a lot of college um, graduates or college attendees. However, it was really interesting to see how many of them expressed this deep love and pride for South LA, had attended some of them, a few Ivy League universities, but other state colleges and universities throughout California. And they were adamant about coming back to South LA, being in South LA, wanting to raise their children, and very committed to this idea of community uplift, racial uplift, right? A very strong um, African American tradition. So we really see this strong emerging place based racial. Um, identities as expressed by uh, this woman in um, this quote here, right? And interestingly, um, a number of second generation Latinos that we interviewed disassociated themselves. I told you earlier 
that East LA is really the Mecca. That's really the heartland of, of uh, Mexican American Chicano culture, although Mexicans live everywhere in California. And our many of our second generation respondents thought their cousins and their friends in East LA were uh, racist and backwards, too nationalistic, and also too Americanized. So that was kind of an interesting, uh, surprising finding. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now and I'm going to talk about this parallel study that myself and three of uh, my research assistants did in uh, public parks and urban community gardens in um, South LA. And as I said before, I did not intend for this to be a study entirely about men, but I discovered women rarely come to the parks alone. They are busy with their own social reproductive tasks. And in South LA, the parks are still not seen. They've changed, they've gotten a lot better, but they're still not really seen as safe spaces. So basically the women I interviewed at the parks were there typically with their families, bringing children in strollers, coming to watch um, husbands or children play soccer, but they themselves, you know, you just did not see a group of women gathered with their friends to enjoy leisure as you would men. So I focused on men and the community gardens are really men's spaces in South LA. So these are five themes that I'm going to go over that came out of the set of interviews we did with over 40 African American and Latino immigrant men at these spaces. And one of them is this notion of sanctuary in nature. So I love this picture. Um, because it looks as though he's praying. He's not, this man is actually working in his garden, but gardens, you know, kind of invoke this meditative um, like state. And we see a lot of that, that this is a lot of what even the men that we interviewed at public parks told us. So um, a man in his sixties, African-American man in his sixties, told us, uh, he referred to um, like the park is the place to go on Sunday, just as you would go uh, to uh, in a church. Um, again, I'm not gonna read these quotes. You can go ahead and read them while I'm speaking. Um, the second quote um, was from an interview that I did not conduct. My um, research assistant, um, Antar Tichavakunda, um, uh, did this interview, which was this deeply emotional interview on early in the morning, he found a young man sitting by himself in the park on wet, the grass was still wet with the dew, he wasn't wearing any shoes, and he had just had this very harrowing escape um, um, after escaping from a rival gang attack. And um, for him, this was a place to come. He was making, facing a very big decision in his life, um, looking at going to jail, and which would mean deportation because he was Afro-Belizean. Um, but the park was like a sanctuary-like experience where the only place where he could come to sort of work through um, these issues. So something we heard over and over again. Um, community gardens were also seen as sanctuaries and these kinds of sites of freedom and reflection. So when I interviewed 63-year-old um, James at a predominantly African-American garden, he compared it to yoga, right? Coming to the garden every day is a place to, to sort of clear your mind, get free of your responsibilities. Um, and I heard a similar story uh, from the quote below, Tomas, who had lost, he was um, a middle-aged Latino immigrant man who had Mexican, who had lost over 50 pounds. You know, obesity, a poor diet is a big problem that plagues uh, Latino immigrant communities. And that was part of uh, what he discussed, but most importantly, this kind of freeing of thoughts and feelings. Um, so a spiritual healing. Uh, a lot of the men write, um, this is the only site. These are men who are not going out, obviously, to play golf. They're not going out to play tennis. Um, there are very few green spaces in these areas. Many uh, people live in very cramped um, housing. So these are, you know, sites of letting go. Um, 
for many African and poor African American and working class Latino immigrant men, it's hard to live up to the ideals around fatherhood, right? Being an involved father, being um, a good breadwinner. And these can be very racially uh, contested. Um, or inaccessible. So the parks were really places, and I'm not saying this is, you know, um, evidence that men are, are or are not good fathers, but it, the parks are places where men could enact um, fatherhood in this public space. And importantly, um, it's one of the few, maybe the only non-commercialized site really that you can go to for leisure, right? I mean, unlike you know, a, a bar, a cafe or restaurant, you don't have to pay any money to go there. Um, oops, what am I doing here? Okay. Um, and um, an important connection uh, between many of the Latino immigrant men and the African-American men in South LA is um, having roots in rural societies. Now, it's true, immigration from Mexico, El Salvador is increasingly more urban, but people are often at the most two generations away from being campesinos, from being on a, a rancho. And uh, many of the African-American men in South LA um, either came as young people or their parents did from Texas, Louisiana, uh, Arkansas, I and mean, they were part of that great migration. So, um, this kind of similar um, uh, uh, ancestral connection with, um, you know, family past, right? Caring for the soil, growing food you eat. Although there was an important difference here. Um, the African-American men we uh, interviewed at the Greater Watts Community Garden um, cultivated a lot of produce. And they had a practice of giving a lot of it away. Um, people in the community would walk by, somebody knew a church uh, that would serve as sort of an informal distribution center. So it was part of a, I, I think a very strong African-American practice of resistance and survival. But we can all see it, see it as kind of a spiritual practice, right? To give away food. Um, the Latino immigrant men um, grew food for their families, but then they were they were selling it also. At the time of our research, this was an illegal practice in South LA. Um, that is now uh, the uh, street vending business has now um, been uh, gradually legalized. Um, but what they were doing was putting produce, kind of like these homeland vegetables, papalo, chipilin, nopales and other vegetables um, into a local um, uh, market that some people have called um, uh, uh, food deserts or um, um, you know, apartheid-like um, areas where fresh fruit and produce is not necessarily available. So if you are ever, if we're ever going to be back in jet airplanes again, and you are coming to Los Angeles, or maybe you did and another time, look up in the left hand corner and that could have been you up there. Those are the, that's the flight path coming into uh, LAX. And so this uh, huge garden, this is the Stanford Avalon garden with over 209 uh, plots, each one uh, about the size, and I'm sorry again for lack of metric conversion, each one about the size of 1500 square feet, you know, that's a, um, that's a nice roomy, the size of a roomy apartment, I would say. And uh, this is what um, part of that looks like. You can see, it's not the most desirable land, the land they've been allowed to cultivate is underneath uh, the power lines. Um, but as you know, uh, to, returning to this theme of homemaking and domestic urbanism, a part of what uh, men find at the parks and gardens is really uh, just um, this ability to gather. And at the gardens, these men make, this is you know very traditional, just these little rudimentary uh, shade structures, these little casitas, little houses, right? With kind of a, 
you know, male sociability, a place to drink a few beers, sometimes grilling um, some food, just resting, you know, old men um, chatting among themselves. And um, both at the parks and gardens, we heard a lot about this sense of belonging, right? Um, place-based belonging, right? Feeling at home. So African-American man who's coming to the garden uh, parks says, um, you know, this is as close to home um, as you can get. Um, at the um, uh, Stanford Avalon uh, Community Garden, a lot of pride in sweat equity. Um, there was previously a, um, a very deeply contested, if you're on, I think it's still available on Amazon. There's a documentary film, it uh, was nominated for an Oscar, it's called The Garden. And it tells the plight of the South Central Farm, um, which was a huge farm in a very industrial poor part of South LA where over 300 Mexican and Central American families were um, cultivating produce it was ultimately bulldozed. That's what the documentary is about. And afterwards, um, there's a lot of conflict. They couldn't get that. They're still struggling to get that piece of property back. I don't think it's coming back, but that's how Stanford Avenue Community Garden was born in Watts. And when the men got this plot, the men and their families got this plot, they had to do all the work of cleaning it up, right? You know, you could, it was just abandoned uh, dead space. And so they're very proud of the sweat equity they put in there. They do not own this land, they rent it. And the rent is kind of high, it's uh, $30 a month, right? So for poor, retired, fixed income, working class immigrants, that's a lot of money, right? Over $300 a year. But there's this very deep sense of belonging. This is ours, a lot of pride in this. And, um, a lot of happiness rooted in this particular space, this strong feeling of being at home. Um, this is a, um, you know, a, a question that we uh, bring up in the book that I'm not going over today is civic culture in South LA. And we can see kind of incipient civic culture at the urban community gardens. This was a meeting um, uh, because these rates that I, uh, the rental rates that I have described are always in danger of going up because water is very, very scarce in Los Angeles and very expensive. And um, there are many organizing efforts that uh, among the um, gardeners, uh, you know, working class, humble Mexican immigrants, not all of whom speak English, they have organized um, caravans to go downtown and speak to the city council to speak for their rights. But there's a lot of um, conflict over this. They do not speak in one unified um, voice. Um, there's a lot of disagreements over governance. There is distrust, uh, distrust of the city, distrust among uh, local leaders. But I do think these urban community gardens do still are, you know, still have the potentiality to become sites of social transformation. And I am involved with another one in another part of the city, which is doing some amazing stuff. I'm happy to speak um, about that later in the Q&A if you wish, but I'm getting close to the end here. So um, what is the upshot of all of this? Um, well, returning to the men at the gardens, I think I want to emphasize similarities between both African American and Latino immigrant men, these older uh, generation of men who enjoy masculine privilege, right? They can be out in public and have leisure time, but at the same time, really, um, uh, you know, are marginalized in similar ways um, through racism and social class. Um, but it's this masculine privilege that allows them to be in these green spaces. Um, and it's their own social marginality that prompts them to seek and have such, find such a more important meaning in these places, right? Um, whether it's this kind of family man, uh, sociability, um, 
respectability, um, sociability with other men. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in this notion of sovereignty, really local sovereignty over one particular small localized space when there may not be this sense of control um, in, in a larger um, society or social institutions. Um, so one question we ask uh, in, we address in the book is the extent to which there is black and brown hostility, because a lot of the prior research in South LA had pointed us in this direction. Um, or is there togetherness? And at the gardens and parks, I would say really neither. Really, a lot of the men are kind of staying in their own lanes. There's a sense, there's a similar ethos. We're all in this together. Um, but um, in terms of, you know, at least in those, those public spaces, a lot of uh, separation and really not hostility, the, the era of violence. No, that's, that is not um, what's happening um, today. Um, and part of what I'm trying to do with this study is um, breaking or understanding these public private binaries in different ways by looking at homemaking practices that happen in the larger neighborhood, right? The homemaking doesn't just happen in the home. It happens, you know, although I didn't study schools and churches, I wish we could have done more. It happens in places like public parks and community gardens uh, and elsewhere. So uh, I think it's possible for us to see immigrant integration um, as a way, as processes of inhabiting places, establishing a sense of ownership, even if you don't own um, the property, uh, establishing sense of enacted activities that become familiar, routine, um, secure. And um, in terms of the larger book, um, I. You know, I think our, our ultimately we see, uh, ultimately we have a very um, optimistic view of South LA, although there are new dangers like gentrification that we did not foresee when we began uh, conceptualizing this study in, in 2014. Um, but we do see the strong um, place-based racial identity uh, emerging in South LA. And in our book, South Central Dreams, we really, um, have hit upon, I think, these, these themes, this noting the spatial transformations of South LA, a shared project between African Americans and Latinos, um, this recognition, especially among second generation uh, Latinos of a, a sense of indebtedness, connectedness to African Americans. Um, again, this place-based racial identity the civic engagement that I see at the parks and gardens is, is weak, but there are like stronger, um, stronger points of connection that we look at. And, um, you know, most fundamentally it's um, homemaking as a process is uh, the dominant um, theme um, of our study. So that's my presentation. Um, thank you for listening. I'm gonna stop my screen share and maybe you'll have questions, uh, comments. Thank you very much, Pierrette. Uh, we have quite a few questions here in the chat. Uh, so uh, let me start reading them. Um, one moment. We have a question concerning, understand the context as well of your study um, from, uh, yes, here, have you, have an idea how the landscape has changed in these years, fences and quality, what about real estate prices? That's one. Yes. Shall, shall I take the questions one by one? Sure, whichever you okay. feel more comfortable with. We yeah. can do this one by one. That's such a good question, um, whoever asked that. And I hope somebody, you know, one of, I, I suggested that I wished we'd had, we had such a great team, um, a lot of wonderful people working on this, but I wish we'd had more resources to really dig in deeper 
with particular themes. And one of them that I mentioned was schools and the other one was real estate. So yes, I have, um, to answer your question, I have uh, a sense from reading historical documents and more contemporary, you know, secondary sources of how the landscape has changed. I do not have a, you know, it's beyond anecdotal and, um, you know, reports from some of my interviewees about how real estate has changed. Um, uh, I will answer both of those questions to the best of my ability, but all of this is to stay is I think somebody should really do a real estate um, study here. So South LA um, initially developed in the early 20th century as a place for the white working class to live. Lit, you know, like those that house I showed you, nice tidy houses. We, uh, Los Angeles then had a strong manufacturing sector right after the war, automobile industry, tire. Um, you can see some of these buildings uh, still around. And um, as deindustrialization changed, as more African-Americans arrived, there was white flight to the suburbs, the San Fernando Valley, the West Side. And a lot of that housing stock then became African-Americans um, homes. And it included, you know, working class families who owned their own homes. And it included very poor families, uh, you know, what we used to call the underclass, right? There's several big projects in Watts, for example, um, projects are public housing, right? Uh, you know, low rent, a lot of um, substandard um, housing as well. So when Latinos, the Mexican and Central American uh, immigrants that I interviewed started arriving in the 1980s, many of them were previously, some of them were newcomers, new immigrants, but many of uh, folks were coming from East LA, from downtown, from this other neighborhood I mentioned, Pico Union, more Central American. These neighborhoods were very crowded. Again, a lot of substandard um, uh, you know, apartments with plumbing that doesn't work, et cetera. And these were families, working class families who had saved up, wanted to buy a house, wanted to set down roots. And it turned out the only place they could afford to buy a house was South LA. So what was happening at that moment? Well, as I mentioned, that crack cocaine crisis, um, we had uh, African-American families who had owned the same house. Maybe the house had been grandma and grandpa's, the parents, then the younger generation, perhaps it with problems with incarceration, drug addiction, mm -hmm. um, couldn't pay their taxes or were selling their houses. Those houses became a, you know, affordable by uh, the standards of the day. So in the 80s and 90s, Latino immigrants were able to buy houses. Gosh, I don't have the figures here right in front of me, but um, let's say about $100,000, right? Still very hard if you're a mechanic and a woman working in, you know, then in a garment sweatshop, you know, that's a significant down payment you've got to make. Um, many of those families did that. And today those houses have gone up in price. So might be worth say four times uh, that amount. Um, so there are significant number of Latino immigrant families who have established home equity, who have bought, we even, my colleague Veronica Montes and I started to write this article. I don't know if we'll ever finish it, but it's about home ownership. And, a set of our families, not the majority, have been able to buy houses for their children. So they have like these family house, uh, like little compounds. Um, the adult daughter lives here, the adult son lives there, and it's just a few minutes away. So it's kind of a new version of the American dream, right? Mm -hmm. Having your family close mm -hmm. together and with home ownership. The last thing I will say about how the landscape is changing in real estate is gentrification. So um, how the global pandemic is going to change, is changing this, I don't yet understand. But um, real estate has been very, very expensive in Los Angeles. 
Um, we've seen um, a new metro line came in from downtown to Culver City, making that upper part of South LA desirable to say new young, uh, the tech bros, for example, right? And so the new, there, there's um, a, a new, I think, a realization among both black and Latino uh, communities in South LA that part of what they've worked so hard for may be lost. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop with there. Yeah, so thank you very much. There's, um, there's a lot more questions coming in. And this one is from Veronika Klotznovak, our colleague from the CMR. Um, and this question is about the genders, if they are mixing the same way and, um, and the rates of acceptance uh, of the same uh, for marriage uh, between a Latino man with a black woman versus a Latino woman marrying to a black man. And what do you think about Latino men if they try to symbolically keep their women uh, to themselves, so more or less about the gender relations in that neighborhood that you studied? Yeah, that's such a, a great question. Um, yes, there is the emergence of um, what some of my colleagues, well, uh, one of my um, uh, co-authors on um, this chapter four on the second generation is Walter Thompson Hernandez who has coined the term Blacksican. He himself is Mexican and African-American uh, background. And um, during our study, um, we met many families who had one member, typically a Latina daughter, marrying um, um, typically a Black uh, African-American uh, man. Some of them were Blacksicans, Mexican, African-American. Also, some of them were Salvadoran. Um, um, a, um, a woman I highlight, this interview is still so present with me, um, and I, I will tell uh, this story. Um, uh, I feature her in, in chapter three. This is an elderly, um, well, a woman in her 60s, uh, a Salvadoran woman who fits exactly that category I spoke of before. She and her husband saved their pennies from all their hard jobs to buy their first house in uh, South LA. And they moved there. They were next to, you know, drug dealers. It was, you know, very terrifying. She fortified the house. When I interviewed her, um, she said all kinds of uh, reprehensible, like knee-jerk, anti-Black racist statements. And as an interviewer, my, I think my uh, job is not to judge, but to probe, to probe. So she would tell me, you know, these drug dealers would harass us. We couldn't walk into the house. Um, she told me uh, her children had African-American teachers who she felt um, singled out her children for punishment. Uh, she was one of these women who had the gold chains ripped off her at the bus stop by Afri African American hoodlums. Um, she told me that she was pregnant and she went to the hospital and she lost the baby and she blamed the African American technician. So I kept probing in this interview, like, well, you know, how about in this instance? Tell me more here. And then at the end of the interview, at the very end, um, she revealed that her daughter in high school had fallen in love with her African-American uh, schoolmate. She told me, lloré por tres días. I cried for three days when she found out her daughter had this black boyfriend. But, uh, you know, 10 years later, her daughter is married to this man. He lives in their house. It's a three generation household. And she's crazy about him. I mean, then she just, I couldn't stop her from talking about, oh, he's the best. He's even learned a little Spanish. He's always, he greets my friends respectfully. I love his family. He's much better than my Chicana daughter-in-law. She went on and on like this. So um, what does that tell us? Well, um, oh, and she loves her little granddaughter who is of course uh, black and Latina, mixed, uh, you know, uh, heritage. Um, 
So what it tells us, what it tells me is it's possible for um, this older group of Latino immigrants to retain a sense of, you know, a deep sense of this kind of knee jerk um, racist talk, but to live their lives very differently, to find actually love and home. Her love and homemaking project involves a black man and a black grandchild, right? So um, in terms of this other question, the sense of Latino men's kind of proprietorship over women, I didn't, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it's something I didn't come across in um, my interviews. Thank you very much. We can sure. see like, how discourse and practice, actually everyday practice, go parallel somehow to each other, yes. Yeah. And, um, another question here from Agnieszka Radziwiłowna from also from CMR is a question about crisis in the construction industry and homemaking in LA. Um, during the 2008-2009 crisis in the construction industry, many people, including Latinos, lost their job. As a consequence, many people, especially if undocumented, lost their properties if they were struggling to repay mortgages. How did it affect the homemaking um, process you studied? That's that's really good question too. Um, and there is another question also from Agnieszka, I can just add it maybe to it, sure. about the shutting in and shutting out strategy. Is it a skill learned in the US or rather something they learned already in practice in Mexico, especially if they come from violent parts of Mexico? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, most of our respondents you know, I, I think it's very much learned in the US and I think it's kind of a, like a temporary strategy and it loosens up um, over time. I think it's really um, a strategy that responded to the 1980s and 90s, which isn't to say it doesn't have um, sort of these parallel or similar experiences in places where organized crime has become uh, very difficult uh, in Mexico, but I will tell you, uh, you know, many Central Americans came fleeing um, civil war in uh, Guatemala, in El Salvador. And I do remember a Salvadoran woman I interviewed saying that she had never, even in, at the height of the civil war, had not seen that kind of violence that she did when she first arrived um, here. But getting back to this other question about, and it's kind of a real estate question again, that's good, about construction. It's true that the construction industry took such a hit in the Great Recession of 2007, 2008. Um, construction is the most important occupational sector for Latino immigrant men in the United States. Latino immigrant men make up, I believe it's 30% of the construction sector now. But if you think about places like Los Angeles or any place like North Carolina or the Southwest, Mexican, or excuse me, Latino men make up a far higher percent, are the majority in um, that occupation. And people suffered a lot um, with that. And yes, did lose homes, there's hardship. Um, there were several uh, people I interviewed in Watts in particular who were now homeowners, but they had lost their first house um, during that um, uh, first recession. And, you know, um, it's interesting. I think in narrative interviews and in the kinds of stories that we tell ourselves, the way we narrate our own lives, we find ways to put um, positive spins on, you know, hardships and things that happen to us. So um, the framing that, uh, no pun intended, but the um, housing framing that um, these respondents told me was they had lost that house. One man said, I didn't like it that much. Um, so I just stopped making payments on it. It was next to the projects. It wasn't in a good neighborhood. Um, and 
you know, some of these people uh, then had to start all over again. Um, uh, another, but another was able um, to sell their first house and move to another one around the block and acquire it. So it was not always um, the 2008 uh, Great Recession, you know, battered a lot of people. Um, but it wasn't absolutist. So in these instances, people lost their house and were able to buy a new one. And the next instance, he told me, uh, I, I, my credit was very bad, but we just put my wife's name down. So I think there's different ways um, of, of getting around that. Yeah. Okay, we have a question. Uh, thank you for this answer. We have a question from Rustam Samadov um, about the theoretical and conceptual approaches that you have applied in your studies of migrant masculinities. Great. Yeah, well, I think I take um, what I've tried to do in this project um, is really informed by intersectionality, just a basic intersectional perspective. Um, that recognizes uh, privileges that marginal men have, the men on the margins have, which includes in South LA, a kind of spatial mobility that um, women um, do not enjoy. And um, also I'm trying to, as you see, put that together with this homemaking perspective and an appreciation for placemaking, right? How place is enacted not only through materiality, but through um, uh, everyday quotidian uh, interactions, practices, routines that establish um, uh, familiarity. Um, so um, I think, uh, you know, intersectionality most often gets used to understand women. As you, everybody knows, it really comes about, I, I think Patricia Hill Collins, Kimberly Crenshaw, a lot of black feminist work really focused it on women of color. But I think um, it's a very, uh, and a very useful lens for looking at men as well. And, you know, some of the trade-offs uh, that are made um, in terms of spatial mobility, um, uh, I will mention that one of the other surprises in our study is how few people um, discussed uh, fear of um, immigration authorities. We had um, uh, a lot of people in our study, people were of diverse uh, legal statuses, naturalized US citizens, fully undocumented, and many people with kind of temporary um, liminal sorts of uh, legal statuses. You know, there's no bright line between legal and um, citizen, illegal and, and citizen. But yet men, the Latino men moved about very freely, um, either in trucks or automobiles or buses, like a lot of men were like to come to the gardens, were on public buses and walking streets. And um, not all women, many women did not feel at ease in doing that. But um, as to why the men did, um, I think there's also kind of like an intersectional connection here with policing, um, the racial profiling of policing in Los cities like Los Angeles and South LA that I believe still targets African-American men more than Latino men and targets younger men more than older men. So, you know, it's not conclusive, but it's just kind of a, a reflection. Maybe it's a hypothesis um, to test. Um, what's, there's so much interesting work right now on uh, deportation and detention. Um, in, uh, because we're living this crisis in uh, the United States. And from my reading of it, I think there's a way in which being in black neighborhoods gives Latino immigrants a certain kind of protection from the police. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, this, uh, doesn't happen, say in rural communities where you know Latino farm workers or ranch hands 
um, are um, succumbed, you know, have a kind of everyday ongoing uh, violence. And then um, this homemaking um, paradigm, um, I'm very attached to because I think it's, it really, number one, responds to the way people our people in our study experience the world. Um, one of our surprises, and we did ask a series of questions in the, um, the interviews about the extent of transnational life. And, you know, uh, I don't know how big the undocumented population in the United States is something like 10.5 million. That's, you know, over 10 million people who are trapped in the United States who cannot go back to Mexico or El Salvador. To do that, you need to have obviously legal papers because it's very difficult and you need to have some money and an ability to leave your home. Uh, in the 1990s, we had in Los Angeles um, and other parts, uh, a lot of these hometown associations, right? That were organized um, and connected uh, with, um, development projects or philanthropy or status enhancing projects with their communities back home. And the people we interviewed were not in these. There were a few who had been more active in them years ago, but they had kind of drifted out. And I think uh, research by uh, Roger Waldinger and Lauren um, Duquette also shows that we've maybe, in our case, kind of um, that moment of transnationalism has passed for, or, or it's just not happening right now for Mexicans and Central Americans. It's really much more about a struggle to establish claims for belonging, right? I think that's the, the major uh, um, uh, challenge today. And one of the ways people are doing that is through these sort of everyday acts of life, livelihood. Um, now, the, the kind of transnationalism people did and in, uh, were involved in were phone calls and sending money home. So yeah, they were still active on Facebook is very popular, uh, you know, phone, cell phone technology, but I think that's a very low level of uh, transnationalism. Uh, so um, as I said before, I think all the people who are doing work in the United States right now on deportation and uh, detention, it's really, really important. But I do think um, many of my colleagues have left out of sight the less um, sensationalistic everyday activities that are allowing people um, to establish claims to belonging and home. Um, so uh, that's why I find this perspective or this framework to be useful. Thank you. There is a question again by Veronika Klotznovak uh, regarding the community Gardena in California. Uh, she asks here, are these individual or shared plots? If individual, then how to obtain a plot as a newly arrived immigrant? What are the eligibility criteria? Are there membership fees or is there a waiting list? Uh, and then there is a question from Marek Kulczyk, which I think you maybe partly have already responded to. Uh, are these gardens uh, not the way to survive like in Havana? I'm not sure, do these people have some experiences to share um, the war or something? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you. Great questions. Um, so there are urban community gardens, and I know there are, gosh, I don't know about Poland, but you know, they were very important in England, Germany, many other European countries. Um, here, there's a long historical legacy of urban community gardens in the United States. Often during world time, wartime, the government has made them very patriotic. Um, today, they are something else. Um, they are organized in different ways. Los Angeles, as I mentioned before, has very expensive real estate and we have a scarcity of water. And those two things combined mean that we don't have the same proliferation of community gardens that we do in other cities like Detroit, 
Detroit is having like a big renaissance. New York during um, like the 70s and 80s had something like a thousand community gardens. There are about 100 in um, Los Angeles. I chose for this study, the two largest ones in South LA, right? They're big. Yes, they are organized. People must pay a fee. Um, they do not own the property. Um, they do not um, uh, farm together. They're individualized plots. Um, and so how do you become one? Well, officially there is a list, but these are informal social networks, right? Your neighbor finds out, you gift some vegetables to your neighbor and your neighbor finds out and um, goes along and uh, gets in. There are fees that must be paid. There's a, uh, um, the African-American community garden I studied had a lot more autonomy, honestly. Um, they had been established since the Black Power move Movement, that's the post-civil rights era, and they had a much looser laissez-faire structure. Um, they were producing a lot, and as I said, they gave away a lot of produce. Um, the um, Mexican and Salvador, Mexican Central American immigrants who are at the community gardens um, typically are farming their own produce, sometimes offering it for sale. Um, that's how the Stanford Avalon Community Garden um, works. Um, in general, they are not as much as I know about Havana where it's really been more about um, total sustainability. People are not living off of their produce. They're not producing um, that much, even if they're selling it, it's not enough for your entire uh, consumption. I do want to talk about another community garden that I'm involved with. And at the end, I don't even know if I can do this technologically. We could try, but I could bring up the web page for another community garden, uh, which is in that Pico Union Westlake neighborhood that's closer to downtown. It's more of a mixed Central American Mexican neighborhood. And um, right now I'm involved in a garden there where yes, people rent little plots, but there's also a lot of um, commitment to social change, social justice, social entrepreneurship. Uh, during COVID times, um, volunteers there have established, I, I will mention that COVID, you may know, uh, coronavirus has hit black and Latino uh, and poor people the hardest in the United States. The neighborhood that's been hardest hit in all of Los Angeles is where this Westlake um, garden is. And volunteers there have established a weekly um, uh, grab and go produce bag. So every Thursday, over 300 people line up and it's all with social distancing, wearing masks and spraying everything down. And they're able to come get a bag of fresh produce, not like old cheese or canned foods, but fresh produce. Some of it's coming out of the garden and some of it's coming from the central warehouse in downtown LA. It's hard to produce that much, you know, the scale of um, farming. And right now we have um, plans. Um, there are these collectivist uh, kinds of plans, but they're also, we're working towards um, those gardens, members of those gardens um, to develop sort of income generating programs that will help the gardens. So, I mean, they are just um, such rich sites, not only for leisure, um, but for, political workshops, uh, mental health um, kinds of interventions, like workshops um, that are, you know, dealing with the boatload of problems uh, people have. So each garden is kind of its own world and has its own character, its own uh, world into itself. And they're also ephemeral, um, I wanna say. 
Um, you know, many gardens get bulldozed as in that uh, video I recommended, South Central Farm. And elsewhere in a journal called Boom, I have written that I think one of the big dangers community mm -hmm. gardens face today is being controlled by nonprofits, well-meaning nonprofits. But there's all these, you know, these kinds of rules and regulations and fees. And um, in a prior study, I really saw um, a group of uh, mostly, in that case, Mexican and Central American women lose the power of governance over a small plot of, of land. Um, so in, um, you know, I could go on and on, but I'll stop. That's, that's exactly the next question. And we still have three questions. So we really want to ask them because they're so okay. interesting. And okay. I hope you'll be bearing with us for, I mean, a few minutes longer than expected. Sure. So the question is from Anja Horolec, also, also our colleague from the University of Warsaw, and it's about the loss that people may experience, the loss of the plot and how this homemaking unfolds uh, the background of the volatile, volatility and temporality <laughs> of access to these gardens. What is this trauma? Um, is this present uh, in the narratives of the people? Uh, and how uh, ha have, you, have you came across any of uh, these experiences in your field work? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. I think methodologically, if you think about it, the, the, um, the, um, the different guard studies I've done, Watts Community Garden, Stanford Avalon Community Garden, and previously uh, Cesar, a garden called Cesar Chavez and the Francis Garden, methodologically, I did, those interviews and I spent time at those gardens when people were there and engaged. And um, at one of them, I was involved in sort of the breakup of it. And there was a sense of loss and a sense of um, temporality, ephemerality. My level of engagement was during that time. Um, but people also find new places to engage with. And I also want to say that um, I think it's kind of an easy trope or easy way to see urban community gardens. In some extent, I do see them as homeland recreation, uh, recreation tapping into a practice that was familiar before and can be transformative of the new space. Um, but there are also, um, among gardeners I have interviewed, people who grew up in cities or who grew up very poor and landless and never had that opportunity to really sink their hands in, they never had access to a little plot of soil. So it's kind of interesting um, that you can see that uh, a narrative of loss, but you can also see kind of a narrative of recapturing something that had previously been lost, something that had previously been denied or um, not possible. And I've seen that in very uniquely gendered ways. Um, so, yeah. Great, thank you very much. We have really two more questions. And uh, the first one is about the role of youth gangs, uh, actually in male socializing in the public spaces such as parks. Gangs are racialized, therefore is there more hostility among the young Latinos and African Americans than among the elder generations? That's the first one. And I'm not sure, if, would you like me to read the last one already? Then maybe, sure. although maybe not. Yeah. There, okay, yeah. then, okay, then there, there's a comment and um, a question from Anna Roszynska. Thank you for this fascinating lecture. I'm struck by similarities in the patterns of anti-blackness between the Latinos in South LA and among Poles in the UK. I encountered similar intergenerational um, dynamics between first and second generation in South London in this respect. The coming together of African Americans and Latinos at later stages is fascinating, but I wonder what role does racism play in early stages of immigration of groups that themselves face radicalization as Mexicans in the US do? Could you comment more on that? So uh, racialization, sorry, uh, not radicalization, racialization of um, as Mexicans in the US do. Great. Thank you. Great questions. I'll do my best um, with both of those. 
So first I'll take the question, which was about youth gangs and is there more hostility among younger men than older men? Um, the short answer is yes and no, I guess. Uh, so, um, and just like the gardens, each public park has its own character, its own rhythms, its own different activities. And um, one of the parks we chose to study, I use um, pseudonyms for the people, but I use real names in this study for the places. And it's called Martin Luther King Park. And um, it's a fascinating site. It's, um, there's so much happening in this park. There is, um, uh, very, it's very actively controlled by uh, a particular um, uh, gang, the Crips. Um, there is a group of, um, uh, well, people who live in the park and who are mired in drug addiction. There's very open prostitution right next to a children's playground with swings and slides. There's um, children and men who come to play soccer and baseball. There's a lot happening at this park. So, um, about gangs, I will say, uh, first off, that um, gang violence is down in Los Angeles. Crime is basic, it has been down for a number of years now. Um, how to explain that? There's different theories that have to do with incarceration or with gangs moving to more organized um, sale, vending of drugs. Um, but we did witness hostility um, and violence um, at the park. But I would say that if there is violence, it's more generally understood um, between men of the same racial ethnic group who are involved in similar gangs. So it's uh, less um, a, a quality of racial, racial violence than it is more about disputes over who controls a particular turf, who gets to sell drugs here, um, uh, and so on. And there's also kind of like self-organizing, uh, self-governance, I would say, like um, this uh, particular park, Martin Luther King Park, I could go on and on about it, but I'll just say one thing about it. There's every Sunday, there's a drum circle, primarily African-American men, but it's also um, others. Asian, uh, you know, a, a white guy from New York came and he made a video, it's on YouTube, you can find it, uh, uh, Latino immigrant men, but they, that particular drum circle has a sergeant of arms. They have appointed uh, one man who's gonna kind of keep things orderly there. So um, there, I, I think in a similar way, gangs have also worked to kind of control violence maybe to be able to sell more and be, uh, you know, have um, an illicit economy produce more. Then the other questions, interesting, I would love to hear more about this case of Pol, uh, Poles, Polish immigrants in the UK who express a similar kind of anti-blackness um, when they go to the UK and uh, encounter uh, black people that they didn't probably see uh, in Poland before. So I think, as I said earlier, immigrants do learn very quickly um, that there are racialized hierarchies. Um, so I think uh, for Latinos, what, to what extent has um, it been about elevating their own status uh, approximating whiteness? I'm not sure, but I think that's a, a, a question. Um, I think more fundamental has been learning um, um, racial, US racial hierarchies um, from before the time they ever immigrate, right? Learning it through popular TV, uh, movies, um, um, messages from back home. Um, the sociologist Nadia Kim has written a very interesting book about 
uh, Korean immigrants and the extent to which they learn anti-Blackness well before they ever come uh, to Los Angeles, right? Through engagements with military bases, this sort of imperial um, presence. Um, and then for the Latinos in our uh, study, you know, that moment, um, Black communities are really in crisis in the 1980s and 90s when Latinos come to South LA, as I described. And so those early stages were very um, difficult. Um, does that play out? I suppose every single place will have its own, um, uh, its own racial order uh, reckoning, but the kind of racial order we see emerging in South LA is one that is not an antagonistic between uh, Latinos and African Americans, but is generally one that's this, about this shared ethos, a shared place, a shared struggle, and um, a um, an understanding of shared fates, right? That we see. Um, so uh, whether that can be universalized, um, I don't know. Thank you very, very much for this wonderful talk and for this discussion as well. And a big thank you as well to all the participants who, who were active here and asking fascinating questions. And a big thank you again, Piavet, so that you oh, my participated pleasure. and and we're part of our webinar. And I hope we keep in touch. <laughs> I hope we keep in touch. Someday, maybe we will gather again. So yes. if you're coming to Los Angeles, who knows when, you well, can look me up. Yes, I will. Well, let's hope you can come to Warsaw also one day and we can welcome you here then. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And we will finish now our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent bye -bye. questions, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>